Welcome to the Pre-Med Experience 2024. Um, I'm, an, I'm an internal medicine resident. I'm going to be helping to moderate the event today. And our first speaker is our keynote speaker, and that's Dr. Tommy Martin. Um, Dr. Martin is here, and he's going to be telling us a little bit about himself, about his journey to medicine and beyond. Um, we're so excited to have him, Dr. Tommy Martin. Go ahead and share your video, and we're so excited to hear more about you. There's so much to say to introduce you, but I'm going to let you do all that because I, there is no way that I can cover all of the bases and all the amazing things that you do. And while we're at it, just feel free to everyone just keep asking questions in the chat and specifically the Q&A. At the end of Dr. Martin's presentation, he's going to be answering your questions directly. Um, thanks so much. Fantastic. Dr. Dan, thank you so much. It is such an honor and privilege to be here and to get to talk with so many of you guys about my journey and things that I'm so passionate about. So I'm going to share my screen here and get the PowerPoint going. So what I'm going to be talking about today is surviving medicine. And in that, I'm going to be sharing pretty much my entire journey throughout medicine and uh, how I was able to not only survive medicine, um, but thrive, med th thrive through medicine. So hopefully by the end of this, you guys will leave not discouraged, but incredibly encouraged on the rest of your career in becoming a doctor. So as I do this, I'm going to give a short introduction. Again, as Dr. Dan said, my name is Tommy Martin. I'm a combined internal medicine and pediatrics attending up in Boston, where I split my time doing adult medicine and pediatric medicine. If you guys want to check out any of my social media handles or channels, they're there on the screen, which you guys could check out and go see my content. So before we get to the presentation, I just want to give a huge uh, thank you to the pre-med experience and to Dr. Dan. Um, I just really, really appreciate the opportunity to share my journey and hopefully encourage hundreds, um, if not even thousands of pre-med students. So um, this is just a quote that I really, really uh, like. It's make it a habit to tell people thank you, to express your appreciation sincerely and without the expectation of anything in return. Truly appreciate those around you and you'll so soon find many others around you. Truly appreciate life and you'll find that you have more of it. So to all of you that are currently here, I appreciate you and I'm thankful for you guys tuning in and for the presentation. So my background, I grew up in a tiny little town in Thayer, Missouri, uh, which I will be talking quite a bit more about here in a little bit. From high school, I graduated as valedictorian and went to a small college out in Kansas. In Kansas there, I played football and graduated in three years with, with a bachelor's in biomedical chemistry. After graduating Kansas Wesleyan, I went to St. George's University, which is in the Caribbean. And here I met my beautiful wife, Phoebe, who is now a pediatrician. Uh, Phoebe and I graduated medical school in 2018. Uh, and from there, we couples matched into residency at the University of Arkansas for Medical Sciences. We were blessed to have our first child during our second year of residency. His name is Oliver. Oliver is a very, very special boy. He is one of the most incredible humans I've ever met in my life. I'm a little biased at being his father, um, but he has a really rare genetic syndrome called Lamb Schaefer syndrome. There are only about 400 children in the world with this, and Oliver is taking it in stride and absolutely thriving. Um, so that brings us to where we're at today. After finishing our residency, I did combined internal medicine and pediatrics, which was four years, and my wife did pediatrics, which was three years. Um, we came out to Massachusetts, where my wife is practicing. She has her own practice. Oliver is almost four now, and he attends a special school, and then I am a combined med peds attending up in Boston. Uh, so that's a little bit of background about myself, and we are going to move on to the presentation. But before we do, as Dr. Dan had said, make sure to use the Q&A feature. The more questions that you guys have, that allows us to give you more value. And we hope that you guys are here today to learn as much as you can about this pre-med experience to ultimately become the best doctor you can one day. So by asking questions in the Q&A feature, that'll help us provide you with the most value we possibly can. All right, so let's get to the presentation about surviving in medicine. All right, so what I plan to cover is surviving in medicine, how I balance career and personal life, and how you guys may be able to do that as well. And then throughout my presentation, you will see how I use social media as an educational tool and do digital storytelling throughout healthcare. All right, so the unlikely becomes likely. This was my first viral TikTok video in 2019 when I started TikTok, so let's give it a watch. Um, 
All right. I share that video because this is a lot of my story. The unlikely becomes likely. Um, and so that video says, why can you, why you cannot become a doctor? And it says, because you do not have a 4.0 GPA, because you do not have research experience, you did terribly, terrible on the MCAT. Maybe you're a first generation physician or you will be a first generation physician. And that is very close to my story. And so I'm going to be vulnerable here and share you some of, share with you some of my upbringing so that if you feel like an imposter trying to become a doctor right now, I hope by the end of this that you do not. And so I grew up in a very small town and my family, um, my mom, dad, neither of them finished high school. And we were very, very poor. Um, our combined income as a family was between eight to ten thousand dollars for a family of five. And unfortunately, with poverty, often time, oftentimes comes other hard, uh, hardships such as drugs and addiction. And one of my family members um, was battling drugs. And so, not only did I come from a poor family, from a family that had never attended college, but also one that was ridden with addiction and um, multiple other hardships. And so through that, my mom and dad battling these hardships, they had to fight for everything that we had. And they loved us so much that they were willing to do everything that they had to to provide for us. So I remember seeing my mom and dad wake up at five in the morning to go to work to try to make a living for us. And they'd come home late in the evening, six, seven o'clock, just covered head to toe in dirt after working so hard all day long. Well, seeing that hard work is what instilled in me that I needed to do that. If I wanted to succeed, I was going to have to work hard. And so even in grade school, I knew I was not the smartest. I knew I was not the most gifted academically. So from an early age, I would wake up so early before school, before first grade, before second grade to start studying for my exams to make sure I did well. And this followed me, followed me all throughout high school. To where in high school, I was made fun of all the time um, because they, people would say my biology book was my girlfriend. Um, but to me, I knew that it was unlikely that in that situation, in my upbringing, in my family's history, it was unlikely for me to ever succeed and to become a physician. And so from a very young age, I knew that and I knew it was going to take hard work and dedication. And so by the rigorous hours that I spent studying, I was thankfully able to become valedictorian of my high school and get a scholarship, not only to play football, but an academic scholarship to go to college. Well, then that led me to um, undergraduate, which you guys saw me playing football there, but I graduated in three years with a decent GPA. Um, I had a 3.89 GPA, uh, and I thought that I would do well on the MCAT. I thought that, you know what, I uh, have always done well on my exams. I've studied really hard. I don't need to study for the MCAT. I'm going to take it, do well, and go to medical school. That didn't happen. I made probably one of the worst scores in the history of the MCAT. It was on the old scoring system of, uh, I think it was out of 36 or maybe higher than that. I'm not sure, but I made a 17, which I think on the new scoring system is around a 480, uh, maybe. So I did really poor on the MCAT and I was told there's no way you'll go to medical school. There's no way you'll get into a medical school with that. But I applied anyway, cause I didn't want to wait and I wanted to become a doctor. And so with that, I, um, applied and I got waitlisted on a school in the United States and then I got accepted into St. George's University and when I got accepted I truly felt that was God's plans for me and what God had in store for me and so I decided to go uh, but with that you see on the Reddit and you see it everywhere else well if you go to Caribbean Medical School you're never getting a residency spot if you go to Caribbean Medical School you're never getting a good job you will not get a good education um, but even though I was unlikely to get a residency spot, um, I got one. I We matched it, one of our top choices. And then on top of that, um, after residency, we got the, the jobs that we could only dream of. And so I share with that broad overview of my background to show you that if you're someone right now, if you're in your pre-med years and you feel like it's unlikely for you to be able to do this. You feel that the grades that you've already done poorly on makes it impossible for you to become a doctor or your family's upbringing makes it impossible for you to become a doctor. Whatever situation that is making you feel like an imposter right now, know that that's not true. And no matter how unlikely you are, you can make yourself become likely to become a physician. And even if you do not believe in yourself right now, know that I believe in you because there were so many that didn't believe in me and didn't believe that I'd make it to where I am today. 
um, but I'm here. And I believe that if you're in that circumstance, if you're in that situation, you can do it too. And so let's talk about how not only to survive in medicine and make it through this, but how to thrive throughout this process. All right, so let's go to the next slide. We don't need to watch that again. Um, so how do you get started? So right now, all of you are on this pre-med journey and there has to be some reason why. And what I need you to do is do some deep soul searching and figure out what that why is, because that is what's going to help you to succeed. And so for me, I had multiple reasons why I chose to be a physician. Um, and I'm going to share a couple of them with you. One of them would be, um, I went on a mission trip, my uh, going into my uh, going into my freshman year of college. And on this mission trip in Sierra Leone, West Africa, I worked in an orphanage. And you guys could see I worked in a hospital there. And while I was spending time there, there was this sweet boy named Abdul uh, that before I was leaving the trip, he said, uh, Papa Tommy, uh, you love us so much. Can I go home with you? And I said, Abdul, yeah, I, I wish I could, but I just can't. But Papa Tommy, you care for us and you love us. Um, and I said, I know, but I'm, just, I'm too young. And he said, well, if you can't, you promise you'll help other kids like me one day. Uh, I don't want to cry, um, so, but I was like, Abdul, I promise um, that I will do everything I possibly can to do this. And so that why stuck in my heart so much. And I held on to that. I wrote that down. And so that was like one of my big whys to becoming a doctor. And another one that I'll share very briefly, but was when I was a, a young kid, probably 13 or 14, I worked with children and young adults with autism and kind of acted as like a young mentor for them. Well, during this time, there was this woman who had said, um, I had never met this woman. She stopped me and she said, uh, Tommy, I need to tell you something. And I said, okay, what is that? And she said, I truly believe it's God's plans for you to one day um, to become a doctor and to heal people all across the world. And, you know, I, at that time was going to be a teacher and a coach. And so I didn't think anything of it. Fast forward to uh, my senior year of high school. I went on a mission trip in St. Louis, inner city mission trip. And in that inner city mission trip, they had an altar call where pretty much you just go down to an altar to talk to the pastor and the pastor prayed over me. And that pastor had said, um, you know, I believe it's God's plan for you to become a physician and you're going to heal people in Jesus' name. And at that time, again, I was going to be a teacher and a coach. And I thought it was absolutely insane. I didn't believe it. I went home and transferred uh, files from my old computer onto my new laptop that my uncle had bought me. And when I did that, I saw an audio recording. I'm like, what is this? And I clicked on that audio recording. And it was that woman from when I was 14 was telling me the exact same thing that pastor told me. And so that gave me another why to why I believe that I wanted to be a physician. And so between those encounters and then that encounter on the mission trip, I had solidified my why for medicine. And I was going to allow that why for medicine to drive me forward every single day. And so if you're here right now and if you have a paper and if you have a pencil, I just beg and plead of you to do some soul searching over this presentation and really get to the root cause. What is your why? Why are you going into medicine? It can't be for the money. It can't be for the status. It cannot be for the prestige. It has to be something more. And there's a big reason why for that, that we're going to get into. And so as you guys are currently on this journey, um, you guys are on your pre-med uh, track right now. And the pre-med years are so hard because it's all about patience and not about patience. And what I mean by that is during this pre-med reason, I hope that you guys have solidified your why and what that is, but that why is not looking at books. That why is not going to classes every day. That why is not sitting in lecture. And so during these pre-med years, you have to do all these things and you're, you're working towards these scores on an exam and the score on the MCAT and making your resume look so good without the reward of your why, without the reward of caring for patients, without the reward of loving for and holding the hands of a loved one who you maybe just saved their spouse's life or seeing a child healed of cancer because you guys caught the diagnosis early. So in these pre-med years, you have to develop patients for your future patients because the work that you put in right now, the sacrifice you put in right now is going to make the reward so worth it. That future reward, that future gratification makes all the suffering and all the sacrifice that you guys are doing right now in these pre-med years will make it all so worth it. 
So in these pre-med years, it is about developing that patience so that you have the experience to serve your future patients. And just remember that your ability to discipline yourself to delay gratification in the short term, meaning you're not going to go out and become satisfied with something else right now. You're going to wait for that delayed gratification so that you can experience that greater reward that comes with being a physician. So from medical school or from your pre-med experience, which is what you guys are in right now, it doesn't necessarily get easier immediately because you guys will go through pre-med and you'll do well in the MCAT and you'll get a good GPA and you'll finally be like, yes, I've made it to medical school. It is the pinnacle. This is what I've waited for. But instead of experience that, it oftentimes feels like this. But it was fun. Not anymore though, is it? Is it? No, not by No, me. it's not fun anymore. No. Not even a little bit. No. Make up your mind. No, no. Think, since you're thinking, now go on, think. No, is no. it fun? No, sir. No. No, sir. Absolutely not? Zero fun. <laughs> so... I hope you guys have watched Remember the Titans, but that's exactly how it feels when you get into medical school, right? Like you've waited for this moment and you're like, yes, I am finally here. And when you get there, it's the same as undergrad, but times a thousand. Like your first week of medical school classes, it just felt like everything you learn in undergrad, they just literally shove down your throat um, and you're supposed to, you know, remember it. And so another analogy I like is it's like drinking from a fire hose from a fire truck, you know, and trying to take a drink from that. It's just like impossible. And so what do we do? Like, how do can we make it through medical school and what do we do? And so what I would say is your first two years of medicine is a lot the same of pre-med. And here you have to develop persistence, that you've developed that patience in pre-med, that you're waiting for that delayed gratification. But now in medical school, you have to persist through the same thing because you're about to get to experience that reward that you've been waiting for in your third and fourth year of medical school. Okay, and so in medical school, um, your first two year, years of medical school, where it's a lot of the book work, try not to focus on making these certain grades and working all this, putting all this work in to get those grades on the exams during your first two years of medical school, which is so important. And passing step one is so important, but shift that focus again to your why that you created three years ago, that you created four years ago. So for me in medical school, when I felt like giving up, there was a time where I was doing very poorly on my exams because I hadn't learned how to study this vast amount of information yet. And I had to make a, I had to make a 98% on my physiology final to keep moving forward because I had made a 57% on the midterm and I had studied so hard. I'd done everything. And so what I did is instead of focusing on making that 98%, I focused on Abdul, who I promised in Sierra Leone, West Africa that I would do everything I possibly can to help people like him in the future. I focused on that woman that told me at 14 years old that God's plans for me were was to become a doctor. That pastor who prayed over me and said that God's will for me was to become a doctor. I focused on those things instead of the current hell that I was going through. And I made a 98% on that phys- physiology final. And then from there, I continued to do well. So those first two years of med school, you have to develop this persistence to get you through because you're about to experience the reward of what you've been waiting for. But it was. And so how can you do that? So let's say that your your why is waxing and you're still not you're still not quite there. You're still not being able to develop that persistence. So something else that I did during medical school was utilize your why and even though you're not getting to experience that reward yet, find a different way to experience that joy to experience that fire and so what what I did was in medical school um, not only just studying for my exams but I found other ways not only to build my resume but to ignite that fire that started the journey to begin with so I found a school in Grenada that you guys could see that their restroom facilities were destroyed that these children were trying to learn in this terrible environment so during my time away from studying I decided that I was going to raise money to uh, to renovate these bathroom facilities. And so I found another avenue to keep that fire alive that had been 
blunted or that had been kind of put out a little bit by the work of med school. So I found another avenue to uh, uh, to light up that ember, to ignite that fire and to keep it alive, to keep me going every single day. And I did that through other acts of service throughout medical school and to keep my fire alive. So persisting through medical school, not only by remembering your why, but finding other ways to keep that fire ignited. Um, Encounters in medicine that changed my brain chemistry. So this is after those first two years of med school, okay, you will get to your third and fourth year. In third and fourth year of medical school, in my mind, is some of the best times because you still have to study some for some exams, but this year, this is your time. This is your experience to spend as much time as possible with your patients. And this is what you've been waiting for. This is what those hours upon hours of studying have been, you know, been for. That's what the sacrifice of paying for medical school, going $250,000, $300,000 in debt. That's what all of this sacrifice is about. And here's one of my experiences. Encounters in medicine that changed my brain chemistry forever. This one came when I was a third year medical student working in pediatric oncology. That means working with children that have cancer. There's this one kiddo that had stage four cancer that was likely incurable. And once I found that out, I was shattered. That crushed my heart and was literally on verge of tears every single day as this kiddo came in and received their therapy. Well, there's this one day that this kiddo came up to me and said, Dr. Tommy, I bet I could dance better than you could dance. And I was like, what? No way. You can't dance better than I could dance. I don't know how to dance and this kid was like oh yeah well show me so then we're sitting here amongst all the doctors and amongst all the other nurses with this kid challenging me that i have to dance so we had a dance off and of course the kiddo kicked my butt because i just can't dance at all but what this showed me was the strength in a child and their joy despite the harshest circumstances and that's something i'll hold on forever so you have these moments in your second or your third and fourth year of medical school that just helps you remember, like, this is why I went through all that hell. This is why I spent those hours in the library overnight. This is why I pulled the all-nighter to make sure I did well on my exam because of moments like this. And I have another one that I'll share with you. So during my third year rotation of surgery, which is one of the hardest rotations in medical school, um, I it was like four in the morning and there was this patient that we thought had cancer and they had a giant lymph node. And so we went in on surgical rounds and the chief surgeon was like, hey, look, we think you have cancer. We need to do a biopsy. We'll get you in the OR um, and we'll see you later. Well, I could see that this patient was distraught, was destroyed, and was heartbroken, um, but we had an OR schedule that we had to attend to. So I asked the chief resident, I said, hey, look, is it okay if I stick back with the patient and talk to him about it? They said, do what you want, but I have to get going. And so I stuck around and I talked with them and I listened to their concerns and their fears and their hopes and, you know, everything. And um, at the end of it, I saw that this patient was had a cross around their neck and I asked if I could pray with them. And so I prayed with them and I forgot all about this encounter. Fast forward two months later, I'm on my internal medicine rotation. And I get a call from an oncologist that asked me to go to their office. I've never met this oncologist. I didn't know what it was about. And um, this oncologist said, hey, I need you to go in that room over there. And I said, okay, sure. And I walk in that room and it was that patient. And that patient said, it's you, it's you. It's the angel that God had sent me. I didn't do anything. I just listened. Um, but it allowed me to have that encounter with that patient and to share in them and share in their sufferings and give them hope. And looking back on it now, even if I only, let's say I didn't make it into residency, let's say I didn't make it as a doctor, these two patient encounters would make everything else I'd already endured for medicine worth it. And so as you guys encounter these throughout your medical school journey, keep a journal of them to help you keep remembering your why every step of the way. All right. And so after medical school, you, you'll go through your third year and your fourth year and you'll match into residency. And then you get to residency. Like you've already developed the patients during pre-med years. You've developed the, the persistence during your medical school. And now you make it to residency and you have to develop perseverance. And I hope I could share with you a little bit how to do that. But let me show you guys a day in my life as a resident doctor. Day in the life is Dr. Dad. So I wake up at 4.15 and drink my coffee. Then I make my beautiful wife's breakfast, who is currently working crazy long hours in the pediatric ICU. 
Then I get ready for my workout. This morning I have a two hour long cycling session, which was brutal. Then I check on my cute little boy and make my protein shake and then make Oliver's protein shakes. And then one of my favorite parts of the day is waking up baby Oliver. He is always so happy. Then it is time to get changed up, give Oliver a bottle and take him to daycare. And then I arrive to work usually around 8.30 or so. Unfortunately, I was not told the adolescent clinic was canceled, but they gave me more time to hang out with Oliver and get another workout in. So I'm doing upper body hypertrophy here. Then it's time to take Oliver back to daycare, watch noon lecture and get to clinic. This afternoon, I am in adult medicine clinic with these goons. In clinic, we'll see anywhere from six to eight patients in a half day. Then it is time to finish up notes and go and see my beautiful wife and my baby boy. All right, so that was a long time ago. You could tell the video was not very good. That was one of my earlier videos on TikTok as well. Um, and that was a day in clinic. That's like the best day possible during residency. A lot of the time is quite a bit worse. And so let me show you a typical yeah. schedule during residency. Um, so during residency, you'll have to develop this perseverance. And why is because during residency, you work very long hours. On average, about 80 hours a week, and you have two pretty much different lives. You have a life when you're on the wards or in the hospital, and you have life when you're in clinic. Unfortunately, residency is designed where you do a lot of work in the hospital. And that means you get one day off a week, and you work long, long hours. And so you you work maybe from like four in the morning to like, uh, I mean, you wake up, I would do, normally wake up at like four in the morning. You can see here, like when I'm working in the hospital, wake up at four in the morning, do my stuff, have to get to the hospital by like 645. And then I would be in the hospital to either four or seven o'clock if you're on call. So worst case scenario, you're working like 12 to 13 hour days. Um, and then on clinic life, it's a little bit better, but majority of your life during residency is 12 hour shifts, one day off a week. And so you get in this place where you're like, wait, I, I went through medical, I, I did pre-med and I developed this patience that I created for my future patients. And then during med school, I developed this incredible persistence waiting to get to this reward. And now I'm finally a doctor. I'm finally a resident physician and you are worked so hard. You can't even appreciate that you finally became a doctor and you don't even get to, you know, kind of like take in that honor and privilege because you're working so hard. You're working 80 hours, 90 hours a week, 100 hours a week, and you're dealing with so, so much. And that's something that I kind of experienced during this residency time. And so this is in not only the work life, but the trauma that you kind of endure through some of it as well also makes you develop perseverance. And here's another story that I want to share with you that kind of uh, highlights that as well. One of the most important lessons I've ever learned in medicine, and unfortunately, I had to learn the hard way. So in residency, I had this patient, and this patient and I had a really good rapport, and we had gotten so close over the past few weeks of me caring after them, but unfortunately, they were very, very sick, and we didn't exactly know this illness that they had if they were going to be able to overcome it. Well, throughout residency, I'd always practiced something, and that's that I would always go and tuck in my patients. This was from a surgery attending that taught me a long time ago that every single day, no matter what, before you leave the hospital, go and tuck your patients in. Let them know that you're thinking about them and that you'd be there the next day. Well, this particular day, we were crazy busy, and it was already close to seven o'clock at night, and I really wanted to make it home to see my wife and my kiddo and tuck my kiddo in. And I'd get to tuck in a lot of my patients, but that one patient that I'd already seen multiple times throughout the day, and I knew that we had a really good rapport and they would understand that I'd see them the next day. It would be okay. Just this one time, this one day, I wouldn't go tuck in this patient because we already had established this great relationship and I'd see him first thing in the morning. Unfortunately, um, as soon as I wake up, I I have pre on my patients and I look at all their labs and things like that. And for some reason, I couldn't find this patient. They weren't on the list anymore. And I didn't, I didn't, I think I knew why, but I didn't want to believe why. And so I get ready as fast as I can. I throw all my scrubs on, I throw my clothes on, get my stuff together and fly to the hospital because I did not want to believe what I knew to be true. When I got to the hospital, that patient hadn't made it. And that patient didn't make it to the next day. And this lesson that I'd held to, that I'd clung to, that meant so much to me, I allowed that one day to go by without doing it. And it was probably the hardest 
but one of the most important lessons that I've learned in medicine, and that is to every single day, go and tuck your patients in and let them know that you're thinking about them. And I'm not saying I'm perfect about it now. There's definitely days where I forget to, or I'm... And so that, uh, I share that, I share that really hard story with you guys to show you that residency is hard. Like residency is really, really hard, even outside from the hours that you spend doing it. And you have to find a way to develop perseverance. One of the most important lessons I've ever perseverance through this. Um, and not only that, uh, during my time, it was during the COVID pandemic and the amount of death I saw uh, was so hard. And you have to find a way to make it through those times, like talking with people. Um, sometimes if you need a counselor, that's okay. But mental health during residency suffers. And this is where you have to have to remember your why. And so this is uh, some messages that I wanted to share with you guys that I received on Facebook after um, spending time during the IC my ICU month during residency, during COVID. Um, to the left here, you see that this is a message that I received on Facebook after um, a woman had commented asking her daughter if this was Dr. Martin. And her daughter says, yes, this is Dr. Martin who was, in, who was the resident during your COVID ICU stay. He was amazing and would call me almost daily to let me know how you were doing. He had to move to another rotation before you were out, but I was sure to call him and let him know that you survived. I think he's a doctor now in Boston. He's a wonderful person, doctor. Um, I was so thankful he was taking care of you. I honestly think he was God's answer to my prayers to send someone in there with you who really cared. And then um, the patient messaged me and said, hi, Dr. Martin, it's so-and-so. You took care of me during the COVID ICU at UAMS in Little Rock. I'm alive after being vented, never got to personally thank you for the comfort you brought me during that horrible, horrible time. Um, during this time, this patient was intubated and I didn't know if they could hear me, didn't know if they could talk to me, or I didn't know if they understood what I was saying, but I made it a point every day to go in there and to care for them just like I would if it was my own loved one. In getting messages like this, makes all of the suffering I experienced during COVID and all the death I experienced worth it. So during residency, you're going to work crazy long hours. You're going to work harder than you've ever worked in your life, but you have to cherish these moments um, because you will make differences in people's lives. And when you get to reflect on that, you will see that it is all worth it. Um, I'm going to skip over that slide. I, I, I know that we're running a little low on time as I want to share this video with you guys as well. Encounters in medicine that changed my brain chemistry forever. This one comes when I was a third year resident about to end my 12 hour shift. When I get an admission with five minutes left in my shift, obviously I was upset. I wanted to go home. I wanted to be with my family, with my kiddo, but instead I had to go do this admission. Well, that's the mindset that I had. Well, I get down there and I get to the room and this person was very ill. Unfortunately, they had incurable cancer. And when I get in the room, I was just kind of going through the motions, getting it done, taking the history, putting in the orders. And then at the end, I just realized like this person is literally in their last days. And here I am with this great honor, this great privilege to get to be their physician. But instead, I am just going through the motions and getting it done because I want to get home. I had a really long shift. Well, in doing that, I felt guilty. And I was like, you know what? I'm just going to sit back. And before I leave, I'm just going to ask them some questions. And so I asked the patient, I said, hey, look, if you had anything in the world to eat, like what would your last meal be? And the patient said, uh, you know, I would have carrots with lemon. And I like, I was like, what are you talking about? Who in the world would want to eat carrots with lemon? Like who would ever want that? Well, anyway, said goodnight. And then I went home and I just couldn't stop thinking about like that. Like one, how guilty I felt just going through the motions and getting it done. But then like, also the carrots and lemons, what? So I decided to make a pot of carrots and lemons. I looked up a recipe, the only one that I could find and didn't think it sounded too good. But anyway, I made it and I took it to the hospital the next day. And when I walked into the room, uh, the patient without even looking, without even opening their eyes, they said, oh my gosh, you did it. I'm like, what do you mean? And they said, you made the carrots with lemon. I might cry. Uh, you made the carrots with lemons. That's what my mother used to make for me when I was a kid. And just being able to eat that before I pass away uh, means the world to me. So thank you for doing that. And so 
this is something that changed my brain chemistry forever because one, it made me never take for granted the honor and privilege it is to be a physician. And two, made me also realize and just um, hone in on the fact that a lot of times the most important things we do in medicine have nothing to do with medicine at all. So that was one of the that was, most, medicine that, that was one of the most meaningful encounters I've ever had in medicine and taught me a very valuable lesson. And so persevering through residency is keeping your humanity and not becoming the robot that medicine wants you to become, just doing the day in and day out things of residency and still truly loving and caring for patients and remembering that is why you started this journey to begin with. And so residency is about perseverance and there has to be other ways outside of just loving and caring for your patients. And that is by maintaining things that you love to do outside of medicine. So for me, one of them is triathlons. Doctor by day, triathlete by night. He doesn't need water. He's an animal. So that was an awesome video from one of the a fan that was at an Ironman race with me that, uh, I started doing triathlons during residency and it helps me to stay alive. And so even though you have these amazing patient encounters, you love your patients so much, you are remembering your why, you still have to persevere and you could do that by keeping alive your passions outside of medicine. And so whatever that is for you, I would make sure to hold on to them because your passions outside of medicine, keep alive your passion for medicine. And guys, after the patients you've developed, the persistence you've developed, um, the perseverance you've developed, you finally get to attending hood and you finally get to the prize. So here's a day in my life as a doctor working in Boston, wake up at four, leave my house at 430, get to Boston at 540, run for about 20 minutes before I work out. Pretty nice. I got to explore a couple miles in Boston and then we go to work out. I did some heavy deadlifts and lower body and some squats today, but honestly, I was feeling pretty weak. So I went a little light on everything. I did some dips and then one of my favorite exercises, dumbbell rows, nice, slow and controlled. And it was some squats and then it was time to get in the pool. This is by far my favorite swim workout. We did 32 by 25 yards. Even though swimming is my worst discipline, today felt pretty good. Eight o'clock, it's time to get to the hospital, see some patients and round with the residents. Some of the most common things we see, chest pain, anemia, COPD and pneumonia. Hopefully get done rounding before noon and then I had lunch with my colleagues today. Then I do some documentation run the list with the residents, teaching, take the patients in, and leave the hospital between 4 and 5 o'clock. Commuting home from Boston literally takes forever. Fortunately, today is about two hours. Then the absolute best part of the day is getting home to my wonderful family, to my beautiful wife, hanging out with our nanny, and then Oliver and I are going to play on our playground. The swing is his absolute favorite thing in the world. Working in Boston makes for a long day, but I do. Uh, my life so as a doctor. That day still looks very long, but let me show you what the prize of being an attending is, okay? And so as a hospitalist, I work one week on and one week off. And so I work only a 20, I only work 26 weeks out of the year, the absolute max. This next year will actually even be cut down quite a bit more than that. So my full-time schedule will only be about 15 weeks out of the year. And the rest of the time I have completely off with no obligations. Also, you're finally getting paid for your work and you get a lot more time to spend with your patients, which is what was my why to begin with at the end. So after all of this hard work and everything you've sacrificed and everything you've went through to get here at the end of the day, if your why is because you love and you care and you want to serve your patients, once you finally get here, I can promise you all the sacrifice that you endured will make it worth it. So how do you survive medicine? Well, I would say right now, figure out your why and hold on to it. So Mark Twain said the two most important days in your life are the day you are born and the day you find out your why. Um, the next is there's no greater feeling than discovering your why and acting on it. This is how you truly become alive. And when you do this, you'll impact every person who witnesses it. So to survive in medicine, I hope that you guys will learn from this to develop patients during your pre-med years. Deve develop persistence during your medical school years, develop perseverance during your residency years to finally get the prize of being an attending, which is the delayed gratification of the honor and privilege it is to care for patients. So let us not survive medicine, but thrive in and throughout medicine. To thrive in medicine, you must not give up your passions outside of medicine. Your passions outside of medicine are what makes you, you. By continual pursuit of these passions outside of medicine, they will keep alive your passion for medicine. This is when you are fully you, fully the best you could be, fully human, fully a doctor, and fully living. And so here is what I'm asking of you pre-med students. Prepare now. 
As a pre-med student, ready your heart, your mind, and your soul to endure the challenges ahead, knowing that the sacrifices you make are outweighed by the priceless moments shared at the bedside with your patients. That is the end of my presentation. Um, I really thank you guys so much for being here, for listening, and for engaging. And now it'll give us a few minutes here to uh, do a Q&A. Dr. Martin, thank you so, so much for that presentation. That was incredibly inspirational. And I see everybody in the chat messaging each other, becoming more of a community. This is amazing. And I think hearing from you and your story was awesome. Um, I know that there's a lot of questions in the Q&A. Before we get to any of those, to make sure that we don't miss it, if anybody wants to view more of your videos, see more of your content, how can they get in touch with you? Or how can they get in touch with the videos that you post? Where are you? Where can people find <laughs> Yeah, of course. So if you guys, any of my social media media handles, it's just at dr. Period Tommy Martin. So at Dr. Dot Tommy Martin, um, you can find me on any social media platform. And then my email is super easy, Dr. Dot Tommy Martin at gmail.com. Okay, perfect. So people can follow you there. And obviously there's a lot to learn from you and the way that you live your life and the way that you live your life as a doctor too. But a question that I saw somebody ask in the chat in the Q&A, and everyone, please keep asking questions in the Q&A. These are amazing. Michaela Stewart asks about how did you have time for all this? You're a parent. You're a physician. You do so much outside of medicine, too. You run. You do triathlons. You do Ironman competitions. How do you have the energy? Do you sleep? Like, what advice would you give for people who are saying, you know, there's so much that I want to accomplish, but there's just not enough time in the day? Yeah, and so I would say to... A couple of things. Um, one would be have a very strict schedule. So you guys saw my schedule. I wake up before in the morning. I go to bed at 9 p.m. So that allows for seven hours of sleep. For me, thankfully, that's enough. Some people need more than that. And by having that strict schedule, that allows me like four in the morning till about 6.30 in the morning mm -hmm. where the rest of the world is sleeping. And it's time for me to pursue my passions outside of medicine. That's awesome. Yeah. So because sleep is very important. I know some people, you know, some people don't value it enough. And it's an important thing to make sure you have the energy to get through all those other things that you do. Yeah. Um, another question that I saw as well, um, was that, you know, tell us a little bit more about your initial application to medical school. Um, what, if anything, would you do differently about applying? Is it kind of, how did you make your school list? And if you can go back and be that same person who was applying to medical school, what advice would you give people or what would you do differently in that process of applying? Yeah, I would have studied for the MCAT. Uh, that definitely, I think would have helped things. Um, I, you know, didn't, we didn't really have a pre-med advisor at my college. And so it was really just about, uh, I thought that I'd always done well on exams. I'd done well on the ACT, SATs and things like that. So I just thought I'd do well on the MCAT and it just wasn't the case. And so for me, I would have studied for the MCAT. Otherwise, my GPA was very high. I had like a laundry list of extracurricular activities. Um, so for me, that's what I would have done. But what I would recommend for you guys is find what sets your heart on fire. Find what like makes you want to wake up in the morning and get up out of bed. And whatever that is, find a way to make a difference in the world about it and flood your CV with that. And at the same time, make sure you're doing well in school and do well in the MCAT. Perfect. Um, just to kind of keep going through questions to make sure we get through as many as possible. Somebody in the chat writes, you know, tell us a little bit more about your thoughts on age in medicine, because some people do medicine in a non-traditional manner. They don't go straight from undergrad to medical school. They may take gap years, do master's programs, have completely different careers before becoming a physician. So what are your sort of thoughts on gap years and, and kind of medicine if you're not going straight from undergrad to medical school? Yeah, I would say that there's no age limit. So I went to medical school with people in their 50s and 60s. Um, there's a resident that I currently work with who I think is in their 50s or 60s as well. And so I would say that there's really no age limit. If it is your dream and your passion and you have good reason to, I'd say never give up on it if that's truly what you want to do. In terms of taking gap years and things like that, I would make sure you have a reason to do it um, just because you will have to explain that to you know, medical school counsel eventually. Um, so if you have good reasons for it, then I think by all means, go for it. Awesome. Um, I'm getting to straight to another question. Um, you know, you talk a lot about finding a why, right? And being able to convey that why. Some people 
you know, they, they know I want to be a physician or I want to be a surgeon, but it's really hard to articulate exactly what got them to that point. Maybe it was a series of life events. Maybe it was just a feeling that they had. How can you truly pinpoint, you know, what advice would you give for somebody to truly pinpoint and then explain what their why is in terms of medicine? You know, I think it truly takes a lot of soul searching. Like you have to dig deep. You, in, in, this is my opinion, right? This do not like, this isn't studied research. This is my opinion. Okay. Uh, but if you don't have a reason, you will not make it like it. There's just too much hardship and too much sacrifice you go through to not have a good reason to do it. And even like making a high income, like money enough isn't worth it. There's no amount of money to go through the hell and suffering a physician goes through to make it worth it. Like you have to have a bigger reason. And so what I would say is do a lot of soul searching and truly figure out why is it like innately, or do you want to be a doctor for the prestige? Because if that's the case, you might need to find a different why you might need to find a deeper reason for pursuing that deep down. Do you want to do it because of the high income? Well, you might want to see like, is that really why you want to do it? Because ultimately, not only if you are doing it for those reasons, you're not doing yourself justice because you will ha live a much happier life pursuing something that literally makes your heart on fire. But not only that, you are doing a disservice for to your future patients if you're becoming a physician solely due to ulterior motives outside of your love and service that you want to provide for your patients. I love that answer. That's awesome. Um, and I think that's really valuable to really dig deep and figure out why you're going into medicine. And then not only medicine, but then when you're choosing your specialty itself, what was your process of kind of deciding between all of the different kinds of specialties you can go into and what ultimately made you choose yours? Yes, yeah, so I wanted to, be, to go do, do surgery initially. And deep down, if in being transparent, being honest, if I truly say why I wanted to be a surgeon, I think it was because of the prestige. I think it was like, because everyone thinks like the surgeon is like the top notch. Like, I think that's why I initially wanted to do surgery. And then on my surgery, this didn't help, but on my surgery rotation, I loved it. Like I loved the long hours. I loved working like crazy. I love doing procedures. I love doing all those things. Um, but then the encounters, the two I shared in the video, the one with the kid making me dance and the one with the woman who was uh, diagnosed with cancer, those two moments made me realize that maybe my tools and what makes me the happiest um, is not being in the operating room, but spending time with the patients. And that led me to believe that um, being going into med peds is probably the most beneficial, not only for me, but for my future patients. And then also uh, med peds is one of the highest sought after for overseas mission work. So it just all kind of uh, worked out. Yeah. Makes sense. Um, and there are a few questions about family life too, and how you didn't just go through this process alone. You went through the process with your wife as well. What was it like being a couple in medicine? Both of your physicians, you both met in the same medical school and then matched together and continued to do all of the things you do together. What's that been like for both of you? I honestly think it's been very beneficial. Um, being in it with someone who understands that you're going to work long hours. And when you get home, you may not feel like talking like, or like we have a day off together. We need to make the most of it. So to me, it was extremely beneficial to have my partner in medicine there with me, uh, not only through the medical school years, but also residency because they truly uh, understand and you get to experience all of that with each other. So to me, it was very beneficial. Perfect. Um, a few more questions. We have a few more minutes. So everyone keep asking those questions in the Q&A. And we're going to try to get to as many as possible. But if you had to, you know, imagine you are currently a student on this webinar watching you talk today. If you're in someone's shoes on this webinar, you know, what would you what would you tell somebody directly? You know, is there anything you would do differently in your entire journey? Is there something that you would really want to convey to a student who knows that they want to become a doctor? Um, but is sitting here today looking at the long journey ahead and thinking, oh boy, that's that's going to take a long time and that's a lot of work. What would you tell that person today? Yeah, so I would tell them that coming from someone who is very unlikely to become a physician, who um, wasn't the smartest, was, wasn't the most gifted, but willing to do everything I could and everything it took to become a physician, who went, I don't, I'm going to be transparent, who went over $400,000 in debt and it took 12 years to become a doctor because that's how long it takes to become a med peds physician. Um, missed out on 
lots of family events, funerals, weddings. Um, didn't get to be there for my family during some very hard times. Um, going through all of that hardship, looking back now, knowing what I know now, I would still say it is so worth it. And not only worth it, but I would do it all times 10 for just the moments that I shared with you guys and getting to experience those moments at the bedside. But I, I believe that truly comes from when I do soul searching, when I look into my heart, I know I chose to become a physician because of the love and care I have for my patients. And because of that, having those magical moments at the bedside make all the sacrifice so worth it. And so I would say, if you're going into medicine for the right reasons, and you see how hard of a journey it is, do not focus on how hard that journey is, but focus on that future reward, and it'll make your current sacrifice feel meaningless. I hear that. I hear that a lot. That's amazing. And that's very inspirational. And I know everybody who's watching really learned a lot from your journey. But now what's next for Dr. Martin, right? You've done all of this amazing work. What does the future look like for you? <laughs> what should we be expecting from you? You know, I it, it's hard to say, you know, that I'd say the future right now for me is to continue to be a combined internal medicine and pediatric attending. My long term goal is to be a residency program director somewhere. And so hopefully in the next five to 10 years, I can make that happen. I also also want to do a lot of innovative stuff with social media use in medicine and how to use that as a learning tool. And then hopefully continue to, you know, make content on social media and grow. And then outside of medicine, hopefully to continue to do marathons, Ironman and push the limits physically and grow my family as big as God will let us. <laughs> That's amazing. One more time, everybody. Thank you so much to Dr. Martin. And again, one more time, how do people get in contact with you? How do they follow your content? Yes, of course. Um, my handles is just at Dr. Tommy Martin, Dr. Period Tommy Martin. Um, those are on all social media platforms. And then my email is the same dr period tommy martin at gmail.com um, dr dan absolute honor and privilege to get to share my experience and i hope this was very valuable to all the pre-med students and i look forward to touching base with you guys on socials awesome thanks so much dr martin and everyone who's watching right now stay on for our next session take care dr martin